Welcome back, Sir Michael. Welcome back from what? From your holiday. Did you even notice I was gone? I did. Or you you're, did. You are always on holiday. <laughs> so how many times this year? I was going to defend myself, but I have been on holiday a lot this year. So where did you go? I went to learn to scuba dive in Malaysia. How did that go? It went very well. I am now a Paddy Open Water Certified Scuba Diver. What does that really mean in layman's terms? It means that I can scuba dive without popping like a balloon. No, I think if you want to scuba dive unsupervised, you need this qualification. So if you try and rent diving equipment, they won't rent it to you unless you have this qualification. And... To be honest, really, you probably still wouldn't dive unsupervised. You'd probably still want to go with a guide or something. But technically, I could now dive without an instructor up to 18 metres. Oh. Is it hard to fail? Probably. I think it's quite hard to fail. I mean, the thing is, you're paying the money, and it's quite a short course. And, I mean, there is a test. A written test. There, there's a written test and a practical test. So you have to do skills, as they call them. So you have to do things like take off your mask underwater, take off your scuba gear underwater, and then put it back on again. You have to be able to, like, breathe from a free-flowing regulator and stuff. But it's all relatively straightforward. So there are certain things you have to be able to demonstrate that you can do. And then, yes, there is also a written test. But I have no idea what the pass mark is. Like, if you got, like, two out of 50 or something, would they be, okay, but you understood why you got most of it wrong, so I'm still going to pass you? Or would they be like, get out? Good. Would you go again? Yeah, go again. Any mishaps? No, not really. (laughs) Sorry to be disappointing. I mean, it was serious business in that you arrive, you go to the diving school, they hand you this book about scuba diving, and they're like, read chapters one and two and complete the exercises by tomorrow. So like you do have to read this book. And the first chapter is the wonderful world of scuba diving. It's the underwater world. It's amazing. Things may appear to be closer. There's loads of fish. There's the magical sensation of floating and stuff like that. And then chapter two is what is pressure? What is buoyancy? What is density? And then The first rule of scuba diving is don't hold your breath. The second rule of scuba diving is don't hold your breath or you'll die. Did you try? No. (laughs) The first rule of scuba diving is don't hold your breath. I think if you hold your breath, you just fail the course. Well, you fail the course because you die. No. Why can't you hold your breath? Because the pressure underwater is greater than at the surface. So if you inhale underwater your lungs fill up to a normal capacity like they would on the surface, except that the volume of air is the same as it would be on the surface, except that the volume of air that's in your lungs, if you took it to the surface, would be much, much bigger. So if you hold your breath and then ascend because you'll float up because you become more buoyant because, you know, you've got air in your lungs and you're occupying a greater volume, well, that air will expand and you will pop like a balloon. Well, you won't really pop like a balloon because you're a human and you're much sturdier, but what will actually happen is that your lungs will rupture and then you'll start bleeding horribly internally and it will be a bad time in general. So don't hold your breath. And then after that, the next chapter is more cheerful again, but then the chapter after that is... Nitrogen will dissolve in your blood, and when you go to the surface, your blood will fizz like a fizzy drink and you'll die. Why would there be nitrogen in your blood? At higher pressure, I think gases become more soluble or something. How do fizzy drinks work? Rhetorical question, I'm hoping. (laughs) Okay, I was waiting for an answer, but fine. Let's say it's a rhetorical question. So, if you go deep underwater, nitrogen will start to dissolve in your blood. But when you ascend again and are at a lower pressure, then 
your blood won't be able to hold as much dissolved nitrogen, so it will turn back into a gas. And the bubbles, depending on where they form, could do very bad things. So have you heard of The Bends? Oh, yeah. yeah. The Radiohead song. And <laughs> Thanks. And also, in reference to decompression sickness, which is nitrogen bubbles forming in your, well, in your blood. So if they form in your joints then you'll be unable to flex those joints. And if they form in your brain, then, you know, you might just die. So that's why you need this license before you can just rent scuba gear, because you literally just might die. But having said that, it's actually completely fine. You know, no one died on the strip, so... Good. No drinking, no smoking either. No drinking, no smoking, no holding your breath! Sounds like fun. (laughs) <laughs> that's like fun you say with like extreme skepticism yeah it was nice it was on like a tropical island called Pahentian. there was like this beautiful beach the water was really clear it was really warm in the evening there were beachside bars that could serve you non-alcoholic drinks if you wanted to adhere to your scuba diving manual and they had a crazy like fire juggling dancing show every night in fact there were two bars on the beach And they both had a fire show and it was clearly the case that one of them had had this fire show and everyone started going to that bar. So the other one had a fire show and then they would just compete to have the more outrageous fire show. They were literally twirling around like burning sticks and like burning yo-yos and then like throwing them to each other and then crazy giant spark things. I don't know. It was mad. Very entertaining. Are you okay to talk about your doctor's trip tomorrow no well i'm going for a colonoscopy tomorrow because i'm full of shit well no actually i'm not i'm literally not that's the problem right that's the problem i'm having right now there's literally nothing inside me because i've not been able to eat anything for like three days this is dreadful so this is gonna be a mad episode then i've been instructed to only drink clear fluids i was agonizing over whether i was allowed to drink coffee it's like is this clear or is this opaque and then you just have some chicken stock (laughs) it specifically said clear broth although was the was the chicken stock too cloudy i don't know yeah this is my life at the moment i am going for a colonoscopy because it turns out my family has a history of colon cancer. I thought and you said because your company's going to pay for it. <laughs> That's the other reason. <laughs> yeah, my family has a history of colon cancer and we were advised to all get checked. Also, you know, it sounds kind of gross and your natural inclination is not to talk about it, but this is literally how Total Biscuit died, right? He literally died of colon cancer and he literally didn't get it checked because he thought it was gross to talk about so oh really yeah did you not know this he didn't get it checked because it was gross to talk about well he he said he was having some like you know trouble on the toilet but he just never went to a gp because he just thought it was kind of gross and then you might think it was just constipation or hemorrhoids or something but in his case it turned out to be colon cancer Maybe I should get it checked then. What, are you full of shit too? I always just think it's constipation or something else, or IBS. Well, it, 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 you know, obviously it probably is, but I don't know, will your medical insurance cover it? Should do. It's very, it's a very slick system. I don't need, I just need to put the receipt and a piece of paper. I don't even need to say what it's for or anything. The receipt is enough and I just say signed and they'll they'll process it and they'll really they'll discount the amount they need it's really fun it's it makes me want to claim it see it's where bureaucracy is failing (laughs) (laughs) i think i meant to fill out lots of paperwork but if you go to a panel doctor they actually do the paperwork for you that was my chief concern in selecting a doctor i was like who's on the panel doctor list everyone says you get better service if you pay yourself yeah you probably do anyway Enough of my medical history. So, you know there's a film coming out called Crazy Rich... Crazy Rich Asians? Yeah. Is that you? What? I just need to ask. (laughs) No! On the record. 
<laughs> isn't the guy in that I know very little about this film, but isn't it something like they're two PhD students and then she goes to Singapore to meet his family and it turns out they're billionaires or something? Yeah, they're filthy one percenters. Filthy one percenters. Filthy 0.1 percenters. Let's not be too particular. No, I'm not a crazy rich Asian. I heard that until in- you go back to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Where did this come from, T? When I'm not working very hard, I like to. <laughs> you like to just what? Just like to daydream. <laughs> you imagine that I go back to my suite at the Marina Bay Sands. Yeah, that they, that they just keep for me. I mean, I like to think there's a reason why you're so mad. <laughs> Everything has no consequence. What? So, so no. The disappointing. Disappointing. I did see an interview. Well, actually, I say I saw it. I saw on my Facebook feed with the volume off an interview where they had the... You know they do this on Facebook where they ought to play the videos, but they don't play the sound. So everyone knows that they do this and they just put the subtitles at the bottom of the video. So I watched one of those and he was talking about how disappointed his parents were that he was a stand-up comedian instead of being a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, yes, this. This what? You know, this is what it's like to be uh, yeah. Asian, right? I still think to this day, certain members of my family are like, so you're not a doctor or a lawyer, so you're a failure? It's fine. I'm a one percenter. No, no, no. <laughs> is that what you tell them? <laughs> no, I just smile and nod. You can't imagine submissive Mike. Submissive Mike. It's easier to just let people think what they want to think. Fine. You'll have your day. This is probably high Mac, Mike. (laughs) It's probably even worse. (laughs) Welcome to Lost Levels Club. Welcome to Lost Levels Club. I have with me tonight Sir Michael. Hello. And myself. Timothy. We're a book club for games. But not today. Today, we're going to talk about horses. (laughs) Grand Theft Equine 2. No Man's Sky. Next. And RTX. RTX! Woo! Is that sufficient? I don't know, is it? Wait, do I need to say what RTX is? RTX. RTX, RTX. The new NVIDIA... Ray tracing graphics cards. Mm. What was the GTX about? G Force. Yeah, but did it actually stand for anything, or was it just like GT? You know, it was like raw. It's fast, and now it's like RTX because it's like ray tracing. Yeah, because GT was a thing before GTX, and they just put an X on it. I think so because it's extreme. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, we'll get to that later. We can, yeah, we can talk about their naming convention going back to the 90s later. This is a world that is rich in depth and detail. All designed to be explored on horseback or on foot. As you live the fateful journey of a gang of outlaws on the run across America. So, do you care? Are you fussed about Red Dead Redemption 2? Not much bothers you these days. I seem to remember that when we played Red Dead Redemption, I said that I'd be interested in playing a sequel, right? Or a prequel, in fact. But actually, I'm not that bothered. (laughs) I'll play it if I have a reason to play it, like you encourage me to play it or something, but... I don't know. For the multiplayer. For the, oh. It's just, I have no doubt that it's going to be really good and that if I start playing it, I'll really enjoy it. But I'm not sure what would give me the impetus to actually start playing it. Okay. So October 26, 2018, you've got two months. Two months to clear out my schedule. Yeah. Change your mind, really. I remember from the first one, there was a lot of just riding between destinations, and that was quite... Uh, fast travel? 
which you didn't know about. I didn't want to pay. I had to pay, right, for fast travel. No, you just set up camp and then said, like, go to this destination and you just warp there. I totally didn't do that. Why didn't I do that? I don't know. I'm sure we talked about this in the in the book club app about RDR. But still, I think actually not fast traveling is way more immersive. And, you know, I think it is actually probably the better way to play the game. I mean, you don't fast travel in GTA, right? You can get a taxi. Yeah, but who does that? So I don't think it's wrong to never use the fast travel system. Talking about fast travel, they're trying to make the horse more your own. By giving it testicles. Amongst other things. Did you see the horse drifting? No, I didn't see the horse drifting. I did watch the trailer. But the horse drifting clearly did not make an impression on me. It's not horse drifting. You know, everyone's just had fun with the words, but it's the horse turning very quickly, but with a really slick animation. I, I mean, I did think it looked really good. I remember that when we played Red Dead Redemption even though it was a last-gen game, I thought it looked really good. And then I saw this trailer, and I was like, oh, no, wait, this looks really good. The animation is extremely fluid. Like All these mechanics they're adding to it are pretty... They're only special because they're getting added to a AAA game. These mechanics are things that you see elsewhere. You've seen them already anyway, like having a base camp having more customizations on your on your horse, having more interesting landscapes, which isn't just mountainous terrain or barren land. Hmm. I don't know. It's just so highly polished. They talked a lot about the wildlife and then interactions between different animals in the world. They talk a lot about trying to make it a living world. The thing is, because it's more of a wilderness and it is much less dense than a city, I mean, can they actually simulate a more realistic world? Because I'm trying to think about what what makes Red Dead Redemption more than just, you know, Grand Theft Equine. It's It's not just GTA on horses. There is more to it, right? But not that much more to it. No? There's the wilderness. There's flower collecting. (laughs) Okay, when you put it like that. No, but I just feel like, you know, GTA and the city, and it's very much a condensed and simplified version of a city. You know, you you can't simulate anything on the scale of the real, like, you know, New York or San Francisco or whatever. But can you simulate the wilderness and a small settlement or a few small settlements? Can you really simulate a base camp and all the people in it and give them more of their own motivations and personality. You could, but that simulation isn't very active, busy. I don't know. I think there's a fine line as well, because if you make it too realistic, it won't be fun. And I think, I think Rockstar are very good at, at making things that ride the line between being realistic until making it more realistic would make it less fun and then they just stop what do you think about all the hoo-ha they made about you know the interactions with passers-by and stuff i don't know i think the only thing i can think of is if someone winds me up and they catch me on a bad day (laughs) you're just gonna shoot them it's okay to do that you know in real life i can't (laughs) yeah but you're looking forward to it Yes, I am. Anything in particular that's grabbing you and making you think, yeah, this is... Well, actually, are you looking for more than the first RDR or you just want more RDR with prettier graphics and that would be enough for you? That wouldn't be enough for me. That wouldn't be enough for you. No, the world has moved on. It's been eight years. Has it been eight years? Cripes. Yep, 2010. So I want the base camp and I want to have that customization. And then I also want... I want a lots of horse customization. I don't know why. (laughs) <laughs> okay, what on earth is the base camp going to do for you? Seriously. It's in the same way you, you have a throne room or your own house. You know, in Zelda, you could... And that was really dumb in the Zelda, in Breath of the Wild. I was going to say, did you do anything with your house? I put weapons on the wall. Yeah, I put weapons on the wall as well, and that was it. And then, you know, I look at Fallout. That was too painful <laughs> to do anything with. 
Yeah, I really rarely interact with these sorts of... Well, I mean, in a game that's all sandbox, like Minecraft, I used to really like building really interesting and elaborate bases. Although mine were always more about functionality than form. But, I, I you know, I don't really bother in like GTA or Zelda or whatever. Like I just perfunctorily do it. Maybe the reason for having the base camp is you collected all these materials in Red Dead Redemption and they serve no purpose for you. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's true. And now there's more of a point to it. And with the horse, I quite like... The, so when you skin an animal, you, you sort of plonk it on the back of your horse and you take it back to your camp. There's more attachment. How, how exactly are you going to customise your horse? Have they actually said that? I don't know. I'm just dreaming here. Like, just dreaming. Is, is it going to be just like a different saddle and a different, you know, like... Purple reins. Purple reins. Glittery ones. All right. Because in, in the first one, he or she just sort of reappeared. Well, they had this mechanic in the first game too, but it basically just never came up, right? Like, I remember at the start of the game getting a pop-up message that said your bond with your horse has increased and now it will, like, gallop for longer for you. Its stamina bar has increased. But that happened, like, within the first couple of hours and then I had a maxed stamina bar and it made no difference. And then I never changed horse because at the time we played it, which was so many years later, they'd released this, I think, on the house DLC. And so they just gave you this amazing horse at the start of the game so i had no reason to ever go and get myself a different horse the narrative is the only thing that's good about red dead redemption really yes the gameplay is actually quite clunky (laughs) yes okay it's definitely the case i definitely remember the narrative of red dead redemption being extremely good i did say last time that that would be the thing that made me, you know, want to come back to this world is learning more about the characters. And we did both say that it wasn't very gamey. It wasn't? It wasn't. So there wasn't superfluous activities, really. Like, you collected these flowers. <laughs> You're just complaining about collecting the flowers and then you said there's no superfluous activities. No, but there was no, like, there was no reason for it. Like, you didn't have to do it. There was no, like, collect the flowers so you can get this or that. Like you didn't have to do the treasure hunts. I didn't feel like I had to. No, there was a lot of stuff you could do, but you didn't have to do it. And even when you did do, inverted commas, pointless stuff for a quest, there was some payout. Like when you had to collect the flowers for the guy's wife. Was it his wife? I think it was his wife, his dead wife. So you got a narrative payoff and some you know, ludicrous situation. But it was the, was it the master or, or something of the something? It was those challenges. Oh, that were... yeah. Now I can do it just to get a bigger tent. So <laughs> now take some sort of box. And I'm sure there'll be a cheap, did you get, what platform did you play it on? PS3. Okay. So you're going to go for the platinum? No. <laughs> just one. Are you fussed about horses with friends? Horse? What? Like online? <laughs> Don't know why I have to be so like abstract about it. Horse? Is there a multiplayer? There sure to be a multiplayer. There wait, was. Wait, a- was there multiplayer in RDR? Yes, there was. Or we just didn't play. It? <laughs> well, I didn't play because I didn't have Xbox Live Gold anymore because I was playing on 360. Oh, okay. You know what would be fun? Heists. Maybe we can do the heists this time because we failed so hard on GTA. I expect the heist to be in GTA to be better. I think the multiplayer heist would have been quite fun, but we just never had the right number of people. I'm hoping that's something they'll address where you don't have to fulfill the, you know, the player count or criteria. Or at least have matchmaking or something. Yeah, or they can, you know, they should be able to automate away that role. I guess so. I'm just imagining... (laughs) If you've got incompetent friends, just kick them out and let the AI do it. And it's not coming out on PC. Uh, why do they hate PC so much? They released GTA on PC. Because everyone gave them so much grief for GTA 4. I don't know. But it's on every console, right? It's not like a console exclusive of any kind. Not on Switch. Not on Switch. Okay, fine. 
it still surprises me that it's not on PC. Yeah, I mean, I really thought they'd do like an RDR remastered or something and then just shove that out on PC, but they haven't, so... I really thought they'd do the same. Do you care about Spider-Man? Have you read any about Spider-Man? Spider-Man 4? No. Spider-Man on PS4. Oh, is that not Spider-Man 4? It's a Spider-Man, isn't it? Is it? Okay. Maybe I'm getting the 4 from the PS4. <laughs> uh, no, I don't really care about it. Should I care about it? I don't think so. You're not missing anything. <laughs> it's going to be... Why no, did you bring this up? Because I was surprised. I'm surprised that it's actually not going to be good for a, a Sony exclusive single player game. It may not actually be any good. I'm surprised that this surprises you. God of War is really good. You just you we just said Have you played God of War, the new God of War. No. I watched some you know it was at PlayStation Access with Rob and his like seven, you know, his Friday feature. And I think it's I think it must be something from the start of the new God of War with the stranger and like this this guy who like compared to us obviously be quite muscly but compared to kratos looks like a scrawny dude and then this guy just like punches kratos through a building and i was like wait what i don't know <laughs> sorry that's a completely pointless and out of context story <laughs> it's just like that's that's my that's that's the sum total of my knowledge about god of war it's ridiculous but good apparently i'm not feeling particularly creative today i can't put in interesting words into nms oh so we're moving on yeah of course we're moving on our next topic NMS next. NMS next. No Man's Sky next. I thought you'd throw in some funny words. No Man's Sky, One Man's Lie. <laughs> so another game you've bought twice. <laughs> yes, I bought it twice. <laughs> so good, I bought it twice. Wait, so good? <laughs> At least you didn't buy it on the same platform twice. Oh, that would... Yeah, actually, you know what's really funny? One of the guys I'm playing it with did buy it on the same platform twice for good reason so the PUBG squad and I actually we actually took a break from PUBG and played No Man's Sky next and they were all harassing me to buy it they were like come on Mike come play No Man's Sky with us I was like I already own it on PS4. Are you guys playing on PS4? Like, no, we're playing on PC. Come buy No Man's Sky. It's like, I'm not going to buy this game twice. Did I not learn my, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on Sean Murray. I mean, shame on me. But they wore me down and I bought it again. And actually, it's good. But yeah, one of the guys I'm playing it with on Steam, when I went to buy it, front and center was his review he said your friend reviewed this game and it was basically saying no man's sky garbage i refunded it but i'll never get those two hours of my life back (laughs) but then here he is he bought it again and he's playing it and really enjoying it and (laughs) we were all going uh are you gonna take down your review and he was like oh i can't be bothered lol (laughs) so so yes we've all bought it twice Yeah, it's surprisingly fun now, actually. Surprisingly fun. The multiplayer weirdly adds a lot to it. I can't quite explain it because it's not like we're actually walking around together like as a pack. You know, we're, we're just all going off and doing our own things. But, you know, the game felt very lonely and pointless before. It was just like this lonely procedural 
blandness to infinity and now you have friends to experience the procedural blandness with well it's less bland number one because they've tweaked all the algorithms and it generates more interesting terrain and now when you see something interesting you can be like oh guys i found like a monolith or i found you know a drop pod or i found horrifying aliens that are eating my face please come help me quickly and then they can fly in and help you so yeah even though it's still quite a solitary experience the fact that your friends are there and you can chat to them and you can share things with them in real time that you can all go there and you can help clear out this nest of aliens or you know fight off space pirates it does make it much more fun. Did you name any planets? No. <laughs> Short answer. I think the galactic database thingy is not working properly, or at least it wasn't the last time I played it. So you could upload discoveries, but it was really wonky about who it thought had discovered stuff when you're playing a multiplayer. And there's just always more planets and always more animals and things it's just such a faff it's like why should i bother naming this particular planet there's millions more you know what makes this planet interesting enough to name one of my friends did try to name a planet shits on fire yo because <laughs> you know, i think you always start out on a total garbage planet because you know they need to give you some impetus so that you feel like you know there's some element of danger so you always start out on some total trash planet. So I started out on a really, really cold planet. And he started out on some other planet where he like stepped outside his ship and then just like, poof, like just burst into flames and like, uh. So yeah, he tried to call it that. And then the profanity filter blocked him and he was like, oh, screw this planet naming business. I think he did name his base Potato Base. And so, to be honest, that's the only base I remember, because it's called Potato Base. All the other bases are just called, like, generic Planet Something Base. And, like, I can't even remember which base is my base. Did you build any cool bases? I built a shack, because you had to build a base to complete a quest. So I literally just, I built a shack. And I just can't be bothered to gather all the materials required to build a nice base. I'll probably do it eventually. I mean, who am I kidding? I'll probably lose interest and do something else, but I might do it eventually. Yeah, I've, I built a handful of bases just because I've needed stuff for quests. Like, there's the shack. I have a freighter, which did you, you can Did you name the shack the shack? No, I should, I should go back and name it the shack. I do have a base on a paradise planet. So there's like an actual really nice planet that's just like not dangerous at all. And I made a base on that and it's literally just, it's literally just like a patio. Like, oh, <laughs> some, it's like some wooden decking. It's some wooden decking that I've then built like a stargate on. And that's it. So you like, you get to experience my nice wooden decking. <laughs> that's literally it. So are you saying your, your capital ship? Yeah. I, I, you in the course of the game, you rescue a freighter captain from pirates and then the freighter captain is like, oh, thanks for that. Uh, do you want my ship? And you'd be like, free ship? Why not? So I have a capital ship. But like, everyone's got one. My capital ship is very mediocre. I think it's like 16 or 17 slots. Slots of what? Slots of inventory. In fact, the game is still like inventory management hell. It's still actually really irritating because like every... I'll talk about this in a minute, but yeah, the the same friend who was like shits on fire, yo, he got like a god roll on the freighter, and he had got a forty slot freighter as his random freighter. But then he rescued another freighter, and it asked him, "Did you want to accept this freighter?" And he didn't realize that when you accept a freighter, you're actually trading. So he just gave away his like god roll freighter and got a trash freighter like the rest of us. <laughs> sad times but you insist anyway, it was his fault and not the ui's fault or the game's fault in any way no comment there's enough blame to spread around let's say but yeah the inventory management in this game still highly irritating so i mean the entire game is this long grind to get more inventory slots 
basically, it feels like. I mean, they, they've just added, they've added a lot more to the game, but, you know, you start out and you, you've got a relatively small inventory, your ship has a relatively small inventory, your freighter has a relatively small inventory when you get it. And the thing is, there's a maximum stack size, and each item also takes up a unit of inventory. So you might have, like, 501 oxygen or something, and, like, that one oxygen will take up as much space as the other 500, because it's, like, another slot for example. So when you get like a random mineral or item or something, and you're like, is this rare? Should I be trying to save this? But then it's going to take up a slot in my inventory for like goodness knows how many hours. Like I'm just going to sell it. You know, like there's a lot of stuff like that. It's a bit of a faff. What's it all for? It's making money. No, I, I think you need to come up with your own reason for why you're playing the game. There's still the mission the game gives you about finding your way to the center of the galaxy. So that's an option. Which have, you, is like have you been? The Atlas Path. No, I have not, because it takes a long, long time and a lot of hyperspace jumping. But yeah, there's this thing called the Atlas Path, and it will help you get to the center of the galaxy, or you can just ignore it and just go there yourself. And once you finally make it to the center, it actually just takes you to another procedurally generated galaxy. So you can just keep going. So I think you start out in the Euclid galaxy, and then once you get to the center, it, you just start again, but on the outskirts of a different galaxy, and, and just, you know, so on ad infinitum. That's one option. You can obviously just treat it as a sandbox and, like, build a fun base or build up your own fleet of, like, support ships and your freighter and whatever. And if you're going to do that, I guess then it's about making a lot of money. And I guess that's kind of how we're playing. Like, we actually haven't been going for the center. We've just been, like, jumping around to nearby systems and seeing the sights. I mean, you definitely need money at the start. Because, you know, if you want to trade up to a better ship, or you want to buy, you know, upgrades for your equipment, I mean, it all costs money. And then one of the most efficient ways to make money that we found was to harvest these larval cores from whispering eggs. So you can find an infested kind of building and it has these like clusters of eggs on the outside. And if you shoot the eggs with your mining beam, out will pop a larval core and it doesn't stick around very long. It will just like disintegrate unless you pick it up. So you've only got a few seconds to like mine the egg and grab the core. But when you break the egg, a load of biological horrors kind of like erupt from the ground and try and kill you so the safe way to do it is to break an egg grab the core and then jetpack up on top of the building and just wait for them to go away and then we were doing this for a little bit and we you know in the course of like half an hour maybe we harvested like five eggs or something it was like takes ages and also it was easy to do it on your own to be honest, because if there's a whole bunch of you, you just end up tripping over each other and like accidentally knocking each other off the building and then one of you gets your face eaten. But I then found a more efficient way to do this. So I would jump down, break an egg and grab it, and then the monsters would spawn. But then I would then jetpack to the other side of the building and just start mining all the eggs over there. And if you'd already spawned a wave of these biological horrors, it wouldn't spawn additional waves of each egg you broke. And because all of the monsters were on one side of the building, it would take them a while to pathfind round to you. So actually, I had, you know, a few minutes unmolested just to keep mining eggs. So by doing that, I managed to get like 10 or 20 plus eggs in the space of, you know, like 10, 15 minutes. So this is way more efficient. But then my friend found a duping exploit. <laughs> and then it was like, well, you know harvesting the eggs is just like duping with extra steps so let's let's just dupe stuff and then after that it was just like <laughs> where's my i need to build a bathtub to keep all this money and we actually haven't played it much since <laughs> just going to show that you're only cheating yourself out of fun in the game it's just as fun this way well i mean i am rich now so one last thing. You can go underwater. Yeah, you can go underwater. That's it. <laughs> I think you can go underwater before, but then it's just... What well, could you go underwater before? I don't know. There's more varied stuff underwater now. The ocean's more interesting than space. 
Supposedly. Supposedly, okay. I haven't really been bothering. No, so nothing interesting down there. Well, the only time I've tried to go underwater was on one of these toxic planets. So it was like really toxic. And my environmental protection on my suit was dropping really fast. And I didn't have more sodium, which is what I needed to recharge the environmental protection. So I ducked into a cave. And then, you know, the caves are considered sheltered environments. So my suit protection started to recharge. And then I saw the cave actually led down into the water. So I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to explore underwater. So I stepped underwater and immediately it was like, burr, 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 your suit is dissolving. This is super, super toxic. And I was like, oh, geez, get out of the water. And that's as far as I've gone underwater. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh... It's not lost. I've got I've got so many more stories. I've got so many more stories. Like the time the ship just decided to generate my laser cannons inside the ship. And so Okay, I was talking to some alien and I said, Oh, can you tell me anything interesting? He said, Oh, you should go and investigate this beacon. It's inter you know, you'll find something interesting there. So I went to this beacon and I found an amazing ship, but it was really broken. And it would have cost millions of dollars to repair, but it was still like a really good ship. Like it had like double the inventory slots of my first ship. So I took it, landed on a space station, then managed to trade it to another alien. I was like, oh, don't mind all the broken components and hull breaches. It's a really good ship with loads of slots. And the alien was like, oh yeah, totally. Please have my other ship, which is also amazing and completely in working condition. So, <laughs> so this is how I got a really good ship. But the problem was that this ship, I mean, they're procedurally generated. And I think this ship just generated the laser cannons like inside the hull or something really dumb. So this is karma for trading in the crap ship. I mean, you say karma, but well, maybe it is karma. Uh, then, yeah, I mean, in single player or when I'm hosting the game, it was fine. But when I was playing multiplayer and not hosting... Whenever I shot the main guns on the ship, it just damaged the ship. It was just like, why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? And the problem was, so I had a ship full of these larval cores, which are worth, you know, like millions of credits. And then, you know, I'm taking off from the planet and it's like alerts are going off and it's saying hostile subspace scan detected and space pirates had come in. And then an alert popped up and said, you know, valuable cargo detected. So they're trying to shoot me. And I'm like, oh, I need to defend myself. And I would shoot my laser and be like, oh, no, now I'm hurting myself. I need an adult. And I was just like running away. And I was like, guys, help me. I'm being shot at by space pirates. I'm like, why don't you shoot them? It's like, when I shoot them, my ship damages itself. And they're like, uh, what? So I had to wait for my friends to warp in and take out these pirates for me. So it's still full of bugs, but no, that's you know, an amazing story. Fun bugs, yeah. It's it's actually surprisingly good fun. I think it's amazing that they've continued to invest in the game. You know, I mean, it is what it came out in twenty sixteen, and got critically panned. Well, it was very divisive. It got some really high scores and really low scores, but I think on average it got, you know, lambasted. Is that the word? That's a silly word. No one uses that word. It got. That's why you're here. That's why you guys come here. <laughs> to hear my. To... Welcome to Vocabulary Club with. Uh, yeah, it just got torn to shreds on average. So. No gaming cliches here. No plagiarism at play. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even going to talk about that one. This isn't IGN. Uh, but. Yeah, you know, they continue to invest in it. I mean, having said that, they did obviously make boatloads of cash because it was a $60 game wasn't it at launch and they did sell a lot of copies there was the big you know No Man's Sky interview with Sean Murray where he talks about No Man's Sky next and how they've like fixed the game you know all the effort they've put in and it's interesting because the perception of No Man's Sky is that it did get ripped to shreds and everyone refunded it but apparently that wasn't really the case apparently the refund rate was only slightly higher than average on PC and below the average refund rate on console. 
well, I say on console, on PS4, it's the only platform it launched on. And so I guess they did make enough from it to fund the next two years of development where they have, well, they've now made a game that I think does largely live up to the promise of the, you know, of the original hype. I mean, could it still be better? Yeah, it could still be better. You know, it's still very, very shallow. How much did you pay for it second time around? I actually paid the same amount both times around. So the first time around, I bought it on the Hong Kong PlayStation Store. And it was only like $200, 200 Hong Kong dollars, which is like 20 quid. And then the second time around, I bought it on Steam. It was like 50% off. So it was still only 200 Hong Kong dollars. So I didn't actually pay that much for it each time. But it was 400 is the sticker price. It's meant to be, the sticker price is $400. 400 Hong Kong dollars, which is about 60 US dollars. So not cheap. But yeah, yeah, on the whole, it is a decent game now. And I guess, well, the other major thing with No Man's Sky Next is that it's releasing on Xbox. So obviously that gave them a major reason to try and fix the game as well. So that means Sony had two years worth of exclusivity. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you can exclusively hold this turd for two years. <laughs> well played, Sony. Well played. <laughs> is it well played, Sony? Or is it well played, Hello Games? <laughs> Maybe that's why they, you know, they didn't need sales. We've got the exclusivity <laughs> to deal with <laughs> Sony. RTX. 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 I don't know. Is, is this something you chant? Can be. Why not? I don't know. Cause it's a silly set of three letters. So this is NVIDIA's new generation of graphics cards, which they've now redubbed from being GTX to RTX. So the top of the line card... Well, actually, was the top of the line card like Titan Extreme or something? I don't know. But the top of the line in like the main line series was a 1080 Ti GTX. Where's the GTX come in? It's always GTX. G okay, a 1080 GTX. And there's a Ti in there somewhere as well. It used to be GT and then there was GTX. And now it's GTX Ti. Assuming the name convention is the same as the new gen, it must have been a GTX 1080 Ti. And now the top of the line is going to be an RTX 2080 Ti. So they didn't even turn it up to 11, they turned it up to 20. What, what, what happened there? Uh, 20's bigger than 11. 30's bigger than 20. Yeah, video card naming is just strange and random. These non numbers aren't as high as 66, 90. Hmm, what graphic card did I have before? I 6750. 6980. I, I had a Voodoo 3. That was my first. Wait, this is fun already. Yeah, th that is my first 3D card. I had a Voodoo 3. Uh, with the 3DFX chip? Yeah, 3DFX Voodoo 3. And then the next PC I had, I did switch to Nvidia. So I had a GeForce 3. I think I had a 20 in it. Was it like 320? No, that seems too conventional. They had weirder names back then. No, no, no. This is early on. I think it was a three digit thing. Because the one after that I had was a, oh, cripes. I, I, at one point I had a 6800 GT. That's quite recent though, isn't it? It's like 10 years ago. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So the first card was at the 3D, the Voodoo. I had a weird, like, 3D Blaster Extreme by Creative. What card would that have been? Who would have made that? Was that a 3DFX card? No, it was a 2D, 3D in one. Yeah, but that might still be a 3DFX card. Because, right? like, because oh. Voodoo 2 was 3D only, and you had to also have a, a 2D card. But with the Voodoo 3, that was a 2D and 3D in one card card. I think you're right. But I just wonder how accurate we need to be on this podcast. I don't know. I mean, this is a trip down memory lane. This is a trip down ancient history. I mean, we're talking about cards before people were born here. No, I, I don't know about that. Well, I mean, conceivably, yes. And then I did get a, a proper 3D add-on card. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did it that way. What do you mean a proper 3D add-on card? Like I just got a Voodoo something that was just a... had to, I needed a pass-through cable. Wow, okay. I mean, I never had one of those. I went directly from like a Matrox something 512 kilobyte 2D only graphics card to the Voodoo 3. And then you went NVIDIA. I would have got NVIDIA. What? Maybe that's the only, the only way we'll be able to line up is work out what Pentium chip you had the, at the same time. Because that's the only way we can work out whether these cards, we would have had the same cards, potentially. Oh, cripes. I mean, like... I had a 450. Well, back when I only had the 2D card, that would have been like a Cyrix 5x86. So I didn't even... It wasn't even an Intel or an AMD chip. You know, I was like... Totally off piste. I, I was so off. I was so off piste. I was like, you know, standing. I was standing on a beach somewhere in my skis. <laughs> Did that work? That pairing? Yeah. I mean, Cyrix used to make. They they had an x86 license. They and they. I actually had to check this because I was like, a Cyrix the same as AMD, but no, they were just another chip maker. Anyway, this is like the tangent of tangents. Like this is the most tangential tangent ever. We should look this up anyway for fun later on, but let's not get into this now because we've completely, we're supposed to be talking about the future, not the past. What's happened, Ting? So the future, the future is ray tracing. Yes, the future is ray tracing. I mean, ray tracing was always five to 10 years away, real time ray tracing. From when? Well, from five to 10 years ago, it turns out, because now it's now. Cripes. Real time ray tracing in a consumer graphics card. It's surprising. Well, actually, I say it's surprising. What do you know about graphics technology? Graphics rendering techniques? I don't know if that's the right way of phrasing it, whatever. I know with with CG and the time it takes to pre-render things. They have render farms, it takes hours to just render a frame. Is that true? Yeah, it's true, even, even today. I mean, it's probably much, much faster than it used to be. But then again, maybe not, because... If you can just render more stuff, you can either do it, you know, at the old quality faster, or you can just still take the same amount of time, but just make it look even better. And I think we just make it look even better. I mean, if you look at like Toy Story 1, for example, and then you look at a modern 3D animated film, you know, there is a massive difference there. So real time ray tracing, they are simulating individual rays of light for every light source and all the shadows and interreflections and blah, everything. What do they say? Like something giga rays per second. Per second. Starting with five or six. Yeah, something like that. With 2070. So the 2070 is six giga rays per second. Going up to... 8 for the 2080 and 10 for the 2080 Ti. That's not a lot of giga rays, really. If you need, like, 60 frames a second. I mean, with all the talk of the ray tracing, I assume it's also way more powerful than the previous gen for just, you know, the old-style rendering too. Oh, that's where there's a lot of discussion about are they trying to hide the fact that that much more powerful because they've introduced a, a bunch of new benchmarks or new measures. Yeah, that's the thing, because if you're not doing any magical ray tracing stuff, is it going to be significantly better than a... It's like 50%, I think. Yeah? Okay. But what I've read is that I did, they're hoping that games will use a combination of old techniques and ray tracing. Yeah, I think you would have to. And that's where you get the benefit. Yeah, because although it's all been hyped about real-time ray tracing, is it really using real-time ray tracing for everything in the scene? Or is it just in addition to the traditional rendering techniques? I mean, ray tracing is massively parallelizable because, you know, the individual rays don't actually affect each other. So you can just slice and slice and slice the problem down across more and more, you know, processors. I mean, maybe, like, SLI will just work perfectly as well with this. If you think about it. SLI is only for the 2080, isn't it? 
Oh, is it? Well, I say SLI. I mean, it doesn't even need to be SLI, really. You just need to just divvy up, you know, which rays you're casting out across, you know, multiple cores. Or multiple CUDA units or whatever they are. I mean, we did watch some trailers showing off, you know, what it can do. And were you impressed? Yes. I was not. (laughs) Actually, okay. I'm being unfair as usual. I was impressed because I know how difficult it is to do these effects because... I did do some computer graphic stuff at university. So I've got like some really out of date and pointless knowledge of how, you know, graphics engines work. But so the demos very heavily emphasize things like shadows from moving point lights and correct blending, you know, from different colored light sources and ambient lights and reflections, reflections in everything, reflections in puddles, reflections in irises, reflections on the water of a plane flying over. And you do notice that in modern games, like mirrors just don't reflect anything anymore because it's too computationally expensive to render the mirror. You would literally have to render the entire scene twice. It's weird. Like Half-Life 2, they tried really hard with the, the water reflections. And now it's... Well, it's because you could do it. Like the, the techniques for faking it worked fine up to a point, but then... As the rest of the scene gets more complicated, you either can't afford to render the whole thing twice. You know, if you render the whole thing twice, then you have to halve, you know, your computation budget for the whole scene. So, so it's a trade off. Or, you know, you can fake it, but the ways of faking it just, certain effects just can't be faked in that way. And so, yeah, it, it literally got to a point where in a modern game now, you'll just notice that the mirrors never reflect anything. But with real time ray tracing, you can. However, I would say, with the exception of the reflections, they've got so good at the faking it now that you don't really notice a lot of the time. Uh, But now I think NVIDIA need to teach people to look for it, to look for the, to look at what they're missing. And that's the the key. When people can see what they're missing, they'll, they'll, they'll ask for it. It's like the iPhone. You don't miss it until you tell them they're missing it. <laughs> What's this like? Like wireless charging? Wireless charging? Who cares about wireless charging? Oh, we've got wireless charging now. It's the most important invention of the century. Quickly, everyone upgrade your iPhones. Yeah, I know what you mean. I don't know. Well, the, the, I guess the other thing is that the demos are very in your face and being quite ham fisted, you know, like reflections, reflections, reflections. They're just like punching you in the face with more and more reflections. And when it is all moving and just seamlessly part of the scene, then yes, maybe it will add something ineffable. Like you'll just, it will just be so much more immersive. I think I just, I just fear for the, the, the survival horror games that they're going to make. <laughs> realistic lighting yeah or realistic lack of lighting hmm i don't know it's just diminishing returns it really is just diminishing returns like at some point making the graphics look better does it add to the game i I mean you're right it, it depends so much on the situation it depends so much like in a very cinematic experience i think it really would add to the game But then the flip side is, you know, for something like PUBG, I don't play with the graphics options turned all the way up. Like, I totally could, because that's why I bought the outrageous graphics card. But I think at some point it just makes the game harder to play if you're trying to just mechanically play it. And so I've just got my graphics set to, you know, still looking nice, but relatively functional settings. Do you play at... 1440p. I'm playing at 1440p and I'm, I'm rendering at a screen scale of 120% and I've got anti-aliasing turned on. So I'm trying to make it as sharp as possible while minimizing clutter and visual noise. You- like I, I take it surprisingly seriously now. It's true. It's funny. I never would have guessed I would have become one of these people. You need a 4K screen so you can see even more detail. Yeah, I need the 4K screen, and that's why I'm going to buy a 2080 Ti. No, no, I have no intention to buy one. Just I'm just putting that out there now. I've heard that line before. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. As of right now, I have no intention of buying one. We'll see. Well, the question is, is it going to catch on? Because right now, these are the only cards that support this. And if these are the only cards that support it, are developers going to bother? Like, does it add that much more? So, you know, example number one I would give would be something like NVIDIA's 3D Vision. You know, they had 3D glasses, like those super fast shutter glasses that you could put on and effectively get 3D from any high refresh rate monitor. But who cares about pseudo 3D, you know, and it just gave people terrible headaches and whatever. So, you know, it's a dead technology. And is this going to catch on? I mean, maybe a more apt comparison would be, I was going to say physics, but is it physics a good example either? Like pe- people do care about physics, but is physics also only NVIDIA? Because it used to be a separate accelerator card. And then I think NVIDIA bought them, didn't they? I should have done more research on this. But, you know, if, if AMD doesn't support this, then are people going to invest in a game engine feature that AMD users are not going to be able to experience? They need to put themselves inside consoles. Another very interesting point. And then you, you PC master racers just won't allow it. <laughs> yeah, without support in consoles, will it really catch on? You were talking about the NVIDIA Vision? Oh, 3D Vision. Yeah. And then you're trying to continue that train of thought. Yeah. Well, I think I'm trying to make two points. I was trying to make two similar but actually different points, and that's why I've just my brain kind of seized up. So what am I really trying to say? We've got a problem of developer support. If it's an NVIDIA-only technology, will people really make the effort to support it if it can't be done on AMD cards? And maybe NVIDIA just actually have such a large chunk of the market in the PC space that actually that's totally fine but you pointed out there needs to be console support and the consoles are all using AMD GPUs this generation so yeah you know as much as I like to think PC games matter and they do consoles consoles are actually much more mass market consoles matter more still I think sadly I don't know, actually. You may not. PCs matter. PCs matter. Oh, you know what we didn't even talk about? The whole Proton, Steam, Linux emulation thing. Okay, for another time. So, I don't know. I mean, the PC is a very significant platform. They've been talking about how PC gaming is dying for decades. And it's, it's definitely not dying. It's growing significantly year on year. So, yeah, what will, you know, is this, the 3D vision comment was more along the lines of, is this going to catch on or is it a dead technology? For 3D vision, I kind of wanted to make the analogy between, you know, the 3D TVs and 3D vision. They were using the same kind of technology, the shutter glasses, and it just didn't catch on. But 3D in the form of VR headsets has made a comeback and you know that is pop is it popular i don't know maybe i'm just shooting myself in the foot what i'm what point am i trying to make is it too soon i i think real-time ray tracing it's always been just around the corner now it's here or is it really here is it is it going to land and is it going to stay or is it not quite going to catch on because it's still slightly too soon but in five years from now it's going to be in everything every graphics card is going to support you know maybe it won't be supporting nvidia's particular implementation of it but they all just have such a huge amount of parallelizable computing power on the card that they can all do real-time ray tracing 
and then it will be ubiquitous, then you may as well do it because literally every graphics card can do it. Yeah, well, what do you think about the 2060, 2050? Do you think there'll be RTX or GTX? Oh, that is that is a good question. From a branding point of view, will you get an RTX 2060 or will they still call it a GTX 2060? Good question. By the time I've got around to editing this podcast, maybe we'll already have the answer. As of right now, we don't know. I think it's, an, it's an, at least another month away, I think. Oh, really? Okay. I mean... I better have got it edited by there. <laughs> Interesting times ahead for graphics cards. Indeed. We'll have to see. As usual, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> it's just like, usually I can just look in my crystal ball and tell what the answer will be. But in this case, we have to wait. No, as, as usual, we have to wait. Any so, final comments? Well, we did have some more topics we could talk about. But, you know, I've been told that rapid fire news is a very daily mail standard discussion so we can put in the daily mail disclaimer no no let's i think let's call it there i need to drink a load of (laughs) enema inducing (laughs) so this is tmi i need to drink a load of horrible stuff and sit on a toilet for hours before um (laughs) before someone sticks a camera up my I don't know why I'm bringing this up. It's okay, you know. It would not be very interesting if you if everything if everything wasn't available to everyone. <laughs> Rampant oversharing. Share all the things. Do you want pictures? I'll ask if they can live stream it. on the blog. <laughs> on the blog. It's like, yeah, so this laptop's running Twitch. If you could just connect this camera to it. <laughs> this is Twitch IRL. Are you allowed to do that? I want to video log it, please. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll That's hi- how going to go viral. I'll highlight the stream. <laughs> we were Lost Levels Club. We still are Lost Levels Club. Please rate and subscribe to us on iTunes. Please, please, please. You can find us on email. Mike.and.ting at lostlevels.club. On Twitter. At Lost Levels Club. On YouTube. And Twitch as Lost Levels Club. On Reddit. Slash R slash Lost Levels Club. What are you grateful for, Sir Michael? I'm grateful I didn't hold my breath while diving and explode. I'm grateful that my blood was not super saturated with nitrogen and I fizzed like an opened can of Coke when I resurfaced. Will you be relieved after the checking and they tell you there's everything's okay? Well, duh, yes. So the, the hassle is worth it. Yes, but you know, I haven't been checking. What are you going to say if I call you up tomorrow and be like, yes, yeah, so I've got colon cancer? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I was like, finally. You're free. <laughs> you're free. Society <laughs> says you're free. <laughs> Society says you're free. You'll get sympathy from everyone and it's free. You are free. So that's how I'm going to have time to go and play all these games. You says, yes. You're not ruled by society anymore. I- I'm not sure it's worth it. Just saying. I'm not sure it's worth it. You'll get to walk around in a robe and it's okay. (laughs) You can walk around in a robe in the daytime. People will expect you to be bold. (laughs) See? Is this in poor taste? I can't tell. It totally is. I'm about to have a camera shoved up my butt. (laughs) I don't know anymore what's in poor taste because there are worse things happening. It's a podcast about computer games. In 10 years time, it will be in poor taste. In 10 years time. But right now it's okay. <laughs> right, right now it's okay. But on the internet, things live forever. So in 10 years time, you're going to have angry people descending on you going, it's not all right to talk about real time ray tracing like this. So Michael says bye. Bye bye.